those peeping toms come in uninvited, force their way into your homes. Yep, through your computer. Somehow they find an open door, back door way in, and bam. Next thing you know, bank passcodes don't work anymore, phone is locked, email passwords have been changed. You are in a frantic panic state. The worst is going through your mind, and it's happened. I didn't eat that. The fastest growing crime in America, and every 14 seconds there's a new victim. The question is, will the next victim be you? I'm proud to be in partner with today's sponsor, Aura. Aura is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software all combined into one easy-to-use app. A win-win. You can beat those digital peeping toms quick and right away with Aura. Protect your family and yourself from identity theft with Aura. Join the 14-day free trial at www.aura.com forward slash SIBO and SNAPA. When Olmsted found work done efficiently, promptly, and well during his travels through the South, when he found well-run businesses, good libraries, impressive churches, and efficiently functioning institutions in general, he almost invariably found them to be run by Northerners, foreigners, or Jews. Nor was he the only visiting observer to reach such conclusions. Another observed that nearly all of the Old South's successful storekeepers were either Yankees or Yankee-trained Southerners. A French visitor said that when you saw a plantation in better condition than others, you would often discover that it was owned by someone from the North. Mm. A history of Southern agriculture presented this picture of North Carolina in the early 18th century. Many of the inhabitants were rough borderers who lived a crude, half-savage existence. Mm. Some were herdsmen, dependent mainly on the product of the range and under the necessity of eating meat without bread. There were also many thriftless and lazy families who had been attracted to the country by the mild climate and the ease with which a bare livelihood could be obtained by hunting and fishing, raising a little corn and keeping a few head of swine, and possibly a cow or two on the range. Mm. On the other hand, there were small farmers, many of northern or European extraction, living industrious and thrifty lives amidst a rude abundance and considerable diversity of food supplies. Wow. They maintained good-sized herds of cattle, swine, and sheep, and the women made butter and cheese. Borderers, at that point, would refer to people from the borderlands of Britain, those included in what Professor McWhiney and others have called the Celtic Fringe, and what Professor Fisher called North Britons. While the making of butter and cheese might seem to be an unremarkable activity in most rural communities, butter and cheese making by these farmers of non-Southerner origins was in fact exceptional in the South. One of Frederick Law Olmsted's complaints during his travels through the antebellum South was the scarcity of butter, despite all the cows he saw. Even among plantation owners, he said, as for butter, some have heard of it, some have seen it, but few have eaten it. Mm. Hard data support his conclusions about the scarcity of butter in the antebellum South, despite an abundance of cows. Mm. In 1860, the South had 40% of all the dairy cows in the country, but produced just 20% of the butter and Dang. only 1% of the cheese. Wow. As a study of antebellum Southern agriculture noted, attempts to stimulate greater attention to commercial production were futile and even the bluegrass regions imported a large proportion of the cheese consumed. Mm. The study concluded, In short, while the South abounded in cattle, the reported production of dairy products was very small. A table based on census statistics... This goes to show that mindset is everything. Yeah, it is. You get the same 24 hours that somebody else gets, and you, you, you know, they weren't even there, half using it. Yeah. Whereas these people over here had the same 24 hours, but yet, and then they have fewer resources doing way better. Right. Mindset. Mm -hmm. Ooh. ...shows that some of the southern states, such as Texas and Florida, had far more cattle per capita than important dairy states like Vermont and New York. And in most of the southern states, cattle per capita were nearly or quite as numerous as in the northern states. Yet the production of butter and cheese per capita in most of the southern states was insignificant as compared with per capita production in the principal northeastern states. Mm. A speaker before an agricultural society in Orange County, North Carolina said, 
It is a reproach to us as farmers, and no little deduction from our wealth, that we suffer the population of our towns and villages to supply themselves with butter from another Orange County in New York. In colonial times, butter was imported from as far away as Ireland. Wow. <laughs> I'm just saying, hey, <laughs> black American culture and Ebonics, you done went on top butter spread. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I know this probably um, um, Thomas Sowell's writing, but it's just how he's narrating it. It's just making it look like he just. What does this have to do with? Well, butter. I guess he's giving the origin of black American culture and, butter. and where the Ebonics has started. There was no butter there. Where butter was not imported, it was often produced locally by people of non-Southern origins. As a scholarly history of Southern agriculture reported, in 1858, the dairies producing whole milk for the city of Louisville, Kentucky, were described as probably as well conducted as any in the country. We still on the on the milk and dairy, <laughs> <laughs> but almost without exception, managed by Swiss or German operatives. Meanwhile, a newspaper in South Carolina said in 1857. Good butter is indeed a luxury to almost every planter in the southern Still country. And there is, perhaps, no one article of food that is more eagerly sought after. Wow. In antebellum Virginia, a Richmond newspaper likewise complained of the scarcity of good butter, saying that the quality of butter available in the local market would hardly be thought good enough to grease a cartwheel. Oh, man. When considering legislation to try to remedy the situation, a member of the Virginia legislature attributed the poor quality of that state's butter to the carelessness with which Virginia farmers prepared it. Okay. One reason for the contrast between the abundance of butter and cheese produced by German farmers in states like Wisconsin, for example, and the scarcity of butter and cheese in the South. Why is he still talking about butter and cheese? But I'm just sitting up here thinking, these people could have been so rich. Those people in the South could have been millionaires if they had the mindset to work it because they had the majority of the cows yeah. um to produce the butter and the cheese yeah so you really need to come down there to get your work wow man that's interesting was that german farmers wherever they were located tended to build fences and huge barns for their livestock and to feed them there during the winter southerners more often let their cows and hogs roam freely during the winter <laughs> even though this meant that in the spring they turned up half starved and it took the summer for them to put on normal weight. Wow. This too was a continuation of patterns found among their ancestors in the British Isles and was part of a more general pattern of carelessness. Mm. Many other observers mm. noticed the broken fences and the stunted cattle running at large, unfed and unprotected. <laughs> their manure was put to no use. Artificial pasture long remained a rarity, and few farmers stored feed for the winter. In Virginia, a French traveler of the late 17th century saw poor beasts of a morning all covered with snow and trembling with the cold. Mm. But no forage was provided for them. They eat the bark of the trees because the grass was covered. Wild Dang. animals. Come on, bring it on back to black American culture and anybody. Well, I guess I tell you how it all started. Butter and we stand at a green pasture. Animals wolves bears and savage dogs attacked the helpless cattle and made the raising of sheep difficult mm. germans were better able than southerners to milk their cows regularly and prepare dairy products while cows owned by southerners were more likely to run dry after calves were weaned mm. a contemporary observer said that even southern farmers with many cows will not give themselves the trouble of milking more than will maintain their family mm. As late as the 1930s, a scholar studying the geography and economy of the South wrote, The close attention to duty, the habits of steady, skillful routine accepted by butterfat producers of Wisconsin, as a matter of fact, are traits not yet present in Southern culture. At that point, the Southern states, with 26% of the country's dairy cows, produced just 7% of processed dairy products such as butter, cheese, ice cream, and condensed milk. Darn. There was a similar contrast between German farmers and Southern farmers when it came to clearing land for farming back in pioneering days. Germans cleared frontier land by both chopping down trees and laboriously removing their stumps and roots so that all the land could be plowed thereafter. 
Southerners more often cut down the tree or even simply girdled it and left it to die and rot. How but in any survive? case, leaving the stump in the ground and plowing around it. I mean, they survive barely. Like, the, like scum of the earth. I mean... That's you talk about how to... Yeah, it was like, like bottom of the bottom. Yeah, they weren't really even trying to be a positive contribution to society. But they had all the resources. They had quite a bit of the resources. I mean, you got all these cows and you're not even going to produce enough milk for your family to survive? But, you know, to have enough? Now, how sorry is that? But I'm still trying to understand where... Where he's going with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although the erosion-prone soils of the southern uplands have been blamed for the poverty of the whites living on them, nevertheless, on that same land, Germans were able to cultivate the hill soil so as to avoid erosion and were willing to expend upon it the additional labor which its topography required so that these soils in their hands yielded excellent regular returns. Comments on the lack of enterprise by southern whites were made by numerous observers in various parts of the South. In Alexis de Tocqueville's classic, Democracy in America, he contrasted the attitudes toward work among Southern and Northern whites. I just thought about something too when I was, they were talking about the South. So before people start jumping in and saying, hey don't, hey, don't get on the South, I'm from Texas, Tennessee. We are from Atlanta, Georgia, and, I, and, I'm, and all my folks are from South Georgia, so we're from the South, so we can joke and make the South joke because that's where we're from. True, but then it's, it's like, I guess he's building up to how blacks, you know, derive their enslaved because now that you think about it, if you have, you know, people who are there and this is how you see them cultivating the land or the lack thereof, your mindset is going to adapt. You're going to adopt those habits, ways, because that's exactly <laughs> what you saw. So I bet you that's how he's building up. It has to be. It better not get all the way through the end and then this is how butter was made. Well, no, I, I feel like this is what he's, he's no, doing. No, well, it was, let's yeah. keep going. Whites as being so great as to be visible to the casual observer sailing down the Ohio River and comparing the Ohio side with the Kentucky side. These were not just the prejudices of outsiders. No Southern man, South Carolina's famed Senator John C. Calhoun said, he looks not even the poorest or the lowest will, under any circumstances, perform menial labor. He has too much pride for that. General Robert E. Lee likewise declared, our people are opposed to work. Our troops, officers, community, and press, all ridiculed and resisted. Many whites according to a leading Southern historian, were disposed to leave good enough alone and put off changes till the morrow. Very similar kinds of comments were made about these Southerners' ancestors mm. in the parts of the British Isles from which they came. Although the term lazy appears frequently in comments on these people on both sides of the Atlantic, there has been no evidence of any such aversion on their part to strenuous physical activity in dancing, fighting, hunting, and other recreational activities. So sloth was not the real issue. Hmm. Nor have rednecks or crackers been prominent in such less physically demanding activities as entrepreneurship or scholarship. Okay. It is the nature of the particular activities in which they have taken an active interest and on which they have expended their energies, rather than the physical demands of those activities that seems to have been crucial. Wow. Not only did many of the groups who settled in the South disdain business as a career, as their ancestors had in those parts of Britain from which they came, they typically lacked the kinds of habits necessary to be successful in business. Among the habits needed to run a business, none is more basic than a steady application to the tasks at hand, doing things in a business-like way. But those relatively few Southerners who did run businesses often displayed no such business-like attitudes. Mm. Even when there was... That's <laughs> a <had> rude customer service. <laughs> wow, man. Interesting. I mean, this is good to know. All this is like brand spanking new to me. I, I never knew that that is where he, I feel like he's going with where Southern blacks, you know, slaves got their mindset and mentality from. He hasn't said it, but it has to be why he is 
you know, yeah, talking about the, this the and, just, and building you up to it. Right. Yeah. Business to transact. Southerners would often stop to go watch a cockfight or a parade mm. or visit a saloon or go hunting. In traveling in the South, a northern visitor commented in the 1850s, you become astonished at the little attention men pay to their business. Such views were not confined to northerners, however, mm. nor to urban businesses. According to a noted history of the antebellum South, the Richmond Enquirer attributed the success of northern farmers where southerners had failed to the social nature of the latter, which led them to gather round the courthouse and country stores to smoke, chew, talk politics, and in general, to waste time. Many southern businessmen were unreliable about either paying their bills or delivering goods and services when promised. Among southerners in general, their improvident spending and the indebtedness to which it often led was widely commented on in the United States and in the places from which their ancestors came in Britain. Even large southern plantation owners with lavish lifestyles were often deeply in debt. Among the Virginia gentry, extravagant and even ruinous bets on horses were common, according to a scholarly study. Nor were Southerners alert to profitable investment prospects, mm. according to observers in the antebellum South. Mm. For example, although there were large coal deposits and a beautiful quality of marble near Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Tuscaloosa. the people there bought coal from Philadelphia, and marble for tombstones was imported from Italy. Wow. In antebellum Virginia as well, Olmsted observed the natural resources of the land were strangely unused or were used with poor economy. Nor was he alone in that conclusion. Wow. A 20th century scholar also commented on the coal available in Alabama. Hmm. The Alabama Iron District is one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest, iron district in the entire world. It possesses wow. a phenomenal natural equipment. Jutting out of the hillsides that flank one side of the broad, open valley are thick deposits of iron ore. On the other side of the valley are the coal mines and coke ovens, and the limestone is at hand. Instead of carrying ore a thousand miles, as at Pittsburgh and the English furnaces, or fuel 600 miles, as at Lake Champlain, the raw materials for these southern furnaces are shifted across the valley by switching engines, and the local supply of cheap black labor helps to give a wonderfully low cost. Mm. Yet it was more than 20 years after the Civil War before Birmingham became an iron and steel production center. Mm. As for the reasons for the belated development of such a promising combination of natural resources, in spite of the favors of geography, the iron and steel industry in the South was slow, in its beginnings and development. Like everything Southern, the industry was retarded by lack of capital and technical skill. Mm. Capital was available from outside the South, or indeed from outside the country, as foreign capital was used to finance the building of the Pennsylvania Railroad and the wow. Illinois Central during the same era. Mm -hmm. But the other factors had to be there to create a promising prospect of profitability that would okay. attract investment. The difficulties of developing those other factors in Alabama was shown by the fact that in 1888, Birmingham saw its first ton of steel run through the furnaces of the Henderson Steel Company and burn out the crude furnace linings in the process. Early explorers and settlers in the antebellum South wrote in glowing terms of the wild fruits, especially the wild grapes of unusual size which excited extravagant hopes of the development of wine industries. Yet early attempts to find a market for southern wine in Britain were ruined by the fact that a sample of wine that was sent across the Atlantic spoiled in the musty casks in which southerners had carelessly shipped it. <laughs> Later efforts... Look at them grapes of muscadine. Uh, 